my name is Anwar Das, and I'm one of the authors of the book Microservices Security in Action. And I uh, authored this book along with uh, Prabhat Sirvardhan. Just to get started, I'm from uh, WSO2, both myself and Prabhat, and I work as the VP and Deputy CTO for API Management and Integration. And this session will be based on chapters 8 and 9 of the book. In chapter 8, we talk about how you can secure microservices that are communicating with each other using gRPC. And in the chapter 9 of the book, we talk about uh, reactive microservices. We talk about its use cases um, and why we need them. Um, and we talk about how uh, you can use Kafka for reactive microservices and how you can secure communications that are happening with uh, Kafka. So that's basically going to be the rough agenda uh, for this session. And I hope to go through a little bit of presentation, make the session mostly based on demos that we'll be using samples of the book. Let's get started. So talking about microservices, we all know uh, how popular and, and dominant microservices have become in the industry over the past uh, couple of years. So as you know, microservice is something that um, takes a particular responsibility in a business uh, architecture and uh, implements that uh, responsibility as a service, which is uh, typically accessed through a network interface. In a microservices world, world there are uh, two main types of microservices, uh, just for the context of this conversation. And these are internal microservices and uh, external facing microservices. So if you think of a scenario where we are trying to build a retail store for, uh, for an enterprise, and if you think of uh, implementing this retail store uh, or an e-commerce website uh, using microservices, uh, there will be things like uh, there will be microservices such as uh, a microservice for browsing your product catalog uh, in the in the uh, retail store, a microservice for processing orders, as what we are seeing here, a microservice for keeping your inventory up to date as the green microservice that you're seeing here and similar kind of microservices that have various responsibilities. Now, out of these microservices, there will be some which are directly invoked by clients. So clients in the sense, these could be the various kinds of applications that are accessing the services um, of our retail store. Uh, and they are usually exposed to the outside world. These microservices are usually exposed to the outside world through what we call an API gateway. So the API gateway becomes the entry point or the first entry point for any kind of device or application that is trying to access these kind of external facing microservices. So for example, if you think of a scenario where a client is placing an order, so a client would press a button on his application uh, to place the order and that request would come in from the client device to an API gateway and the API gateway would do some form of uh, security authentication, authorization and things like that and uh, hand over the request to the order processing microservice. Now, the order processing microservice in this case becomes the external facing uh, microservice. So the order service processing microservice would need the assistance of other microservices internally to complete its uh, functions, such as the inventory microservice for updating the inventory once an order has been processed. So as you can see, the, the inventory microservice is not a microservice that will ever be exposed directly from the outside world. It will always be a microservice that is being used internally by other microservices. So you can see that there are two types of microservices here, the external facing ones and the internal ones. Now usually the external facing microservices are exposed over protocols like uh, HTTP, because these are exposed, their functionality are exposed to through APIs uh, to developers of different kinds of applications, could be web applications, could be uh, mobile applications and so on. So they have to be human readable and, and humans should be able to read and understand uh, the contract, the API. And therefore, these are usually exposed uh, over HTTP protocols. Uh, but for internal microservices, these are for the consumption of other microservices. So these are used, uh, programmed again, yes, by developers themselves, but these are developers who are like within the organization who understand and know the domain 
um, and therefore they don't necessarily have to be uh, as human readable as such. Uh, and another important aspect when it comes to microservices is that usually uh, a microservice architecture ends up with lots of microservices that are communicating with each other over the network. So the resource utilization and performance, the network performance becomes very important. And that is why this uh, gRPC protocol has become uh, so popular because it is uh, highly resource optimized, uh, resource efficient. It doesn't take as much resources as uh, traditional HTTP requests. Uh, and it is very performant as well. It is very fast in, in passing uh, messages compared to uh, traditional HTTP due to various optimizations it has done. And because of the fact that it doesn't have to be as human readable as such, uh, the, the, the communication between the internal microservices, uh, gRPC becomes a natural choice for microservices that are communicating with each other uh, within the network uh, due to the, the reasons I mentioned. So that is basically why uh, gRPC has become very popular in the industry now. And that is basically why we've, we are, we, we've decided to talk about how you can secure service to service communication uh, that are happening uh, over gRPC. So uh, this is basically the use case uh, of gRPC in a microservices architecture. Uh, so let's uh, go directly into some samples and see how we can secure microservices over gRPC. In the example that we just talked about, we talked about a case where the order processing microservice talks to the inventory microservice whenever uh, an order has been processed. So one of the problems with this approach is that there could also be uh, another microservice, um, what we call a bogus microservice, pretending to be the order processing microservice. So if this microservice makes a request to the inventory microservice with the same uh, payload, with the same message, uh, the inventory microservice will not know how to identify whether this is coming from a bogus microservice or the uh, genuine uh, order processing microservice. So to solve this problem, Mutual TLS uh, is something uh, we use uh, in gRPC so that the inventory microservice knows that it is being talked to by entities that it uh, trusts. So let's see how we can quickly enable um, MTLS between two uh, communicating microservices uh, over gRPC. As I said before, we'll be using uh, samples of uh, chapter 8 here of the book. So if you go to chapter 8 of the book, you can see these uh, samples. Uh, so we'll run a set of examples and see what it looks like. So first, uh, I'm going to compile the samples in, in, uh, in sample 2 in, in chapter 8. Let me increase the size of it a bit. So execute this command. So you can find all of these instructions on the book itself to compile the samples. So these samples are in Java. Um, most of the samples are in Java and we use uh, Spring Boot mostly uh, for these applications. So I have my uh, microservices compiled. And then the next step is to create the certificates uh, that are needed for the client and the server. So going back to this picture. So in this case, the client becomes, uh, we are talking about the communication between these two entities. So in this case, the client becomes the order processing microservice and the server becomes the inventory microservice. So let's create the certificates that we need um, uh, for the client and the server. So we have this uh, share script available in the samples that will basically create the uh, certificates that are needed for the client and the server. First, it creates uh, a CA, basically the certificate of authority and the keys uh, that represent the certificate authority. And once that is done, it will basically uh, create the certificates and the key stores for the client and the server respectively. Uh, so it takes a little bit of time as you are doing it. So we can see the CA certificate has been created. So we are basically creating the certificates for this entity and this entity, and we are going to install them um, and I'm trying to get the communication working uh, between the two. All right, it looks like our certificates are uh, created. So now the next step, uh, we are going to start uh, the server process. So we have this uh, command that starts the server process. 
you can paste it here. So if you observe this uh, command closely, so we are basically executing a process and we are passing in this parameter, which is to be the host and the port of the server process. And we are uh, passing in three more variables, uh, which is which would be the set server certificate, uh, the, the certificate container, which contains the private key uh, of the server and the CA certificate as well. Uh, so the CA certificate is needed to trust the incoming uh, client uh, communications. So let's go ahead and start the server process. So as you can see here, it says the server is started. Um, and then let's go and start the client process. So as I mentioned before, uh, the client becomes the order processing service here. We just started the inventory service and now we are going to start the uh, order processing microservice. So as we start it, it will basically um, simulate a, a request and you will see, we are supposed to see some logs uh, on the uh, server to, um, uh, to make sure that the client request has been uh, processed. So similar to starting the server, uh, when we start the client here, we pass in the connection details of the server, which is uh, the host and the port. And uh, again, similar to the server, we pass in the uh, CA certificate, the client certificate and the uh, client uh, certificate container. So let's go ahead and start the client process. So as you can see here, we get a message saying updated inventory for one product. So this is the response. And uh, here on the server side, we see uh, received order ID one, which means the communication has happened between the two and uh, the, 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 the inventory has been updated. Now we can again verify this uh, by uh, trying to run the client in TLS only mode. So in TLS only mode, what happens is the communication channel becomes encrypted. Uh, however, uh, the mutual TLS doesn't happen. So mutual TLS, so in a traditional TLS scenario, what happens is the client verifies the authenticity of the server um, and that's it. Uh, the communication becomes encrypted, the channel becomes encrypted. Uh, but the server does not uh, verify the client back in return. In TLS only mode, the client needs the server certificate, uh, but the server doesn't need the client certificate to verify because uh, it's only the client that verifies the server. So if you try to run the client in TLS only mode, uh, which means, uh, so about this command, but this command is what I'm talking about. So if you start the client uh, with uh, just the CA certificate so that it, uh, it, it can trust the server but it uh, cannot uh, basically present its server certificate to the server. Uh, we are supposed to see an error here, an authentication error. So as you can see here, we are getting uh, a connection refused because mutual TLS has failed uh, in this instance because uh, although the client can trust the server, the server cannot trust the client in this particular instance because we started the client without uh, specifying its uh, key store locations. So that's basically how you, uh, how you can enable mutual TLS. So if you quickly look at the code um, of this, so again, these samples are on GitHub, you can go and uh, have a look at them. So this is basically the uh, inventory client class. So as I mentioned before, the samples are in Java. If you're familiar with Java, you can understand them, but you don't really need to know, have any Java knowledge to run these examples. Um, so we have this uh, build SSL context method, which is uh, supposed to return an SSL context object coming from the uh, Netty package. So we initialize or rather we set all of the uh, our certificate files into this uh, builder and return it. So this method is being used by the constructor which passes this information into uh, Netty. So that's basically how you uh, initialize the client and the server initialization also happens uh, in a similar fashion. So you have this get SSL context builder which be, uh, basically builds the SSL uh, context and then this is being used by the server start method by passing in that particular those particular details into the uh, Netty server process.
So that's basically uh, some samples of the code uh, that we used. 